Today I'll be talking about the exciting field of germanium vacancy color centers and diamond. Before we begin, a brief summary of how this presentation will go. I'll answer the question of why diamond, move into the motivation for finding new optically active color centers in diamond, the major research being conducted, the importance of the photonic properties of this research, and finally, the advantages of germanium vacancies over you know, vacancies such as the silicon vacancy, the nitrogen vacancy. Also, I will discuss the future outlook and the potential uses. So first, uh, the diamond architecture is great overall because diamond has these advantageous material properties. It's chemically inert, it's optically transparent, and it's thermally stable. It also has multiple commercial and industrial fabrication methods, which have allowed for optimization and creation of high purity diamond, which can be used for quantum optical research. The key advantages are the coherence at room temperature, the transparency, which allows for optical pumping of the ground state, as well as the ability to couple to optical fibers, and finally, relative abundance of naturally occurring color centers such as nitrogen vacancies. The nitrogen vacancy center, as seen over here, has been studied since the 1970s and has a well understood band structure. Spin manipulation through Rabi oscillations and spin echoes have been demonstrated since the late 1990s, and recently, single shot readout has been developed using quantum non, -demolition, non demolition methodology. Now moving on for why researchers are actively searching for other color centers in diamond. Well, the main reason is the average color center, nitrogen vacancies, have a wide thermal broadening in their photoluminescence spectra. Thus, we seek reduced thermal broadening, we seek increased quantum efficiency, and we seek increased charge stability of these other color centers. Now, split vacancy centers, such as silicon vacancies and germanium vacancies, we can see we have a germanium vacancy over here. It's called a split vacancy because there's a vacancy on each side. Can be used for single emitters for quantum information processing and communication. They can also be used for quantum memory registries due to spin manipulation, as well as uh, potentially used for multi-body physics due to strongly interacting photons. Now the origins of the GEV center come from the first principle calculations of Goss et al, who predicted that the GEV center would have a split vacancy structure similar to that as uh, silicon vacancy centers, as well as a similar emission peak. In 2015, three papers were published verifying the feasibility of the split vacancy center, as well as the ZPL, which was confirmed at 602. Now, these three papers were the Iwasaki paper, the Polyanov paper, and the Ikamov paper. More importantly, all three papers were published within about the same month as each other and have three different fabrication techniques for making diamond with germanium vacancy centers. Just to remind you, this is about a year and a half old. Starting with the Iwasaki paper, we have the first two fabrication methods, ion implantation and MPCVD. Ion implantation provides dosage control as well as arrangement control and has been used in other vacancy centers such as silicon vacancies to make prearranged uh, sections. Now, the issue with ion implantation is the stress imposed on the lattice from the bombardment of these ions. To reduce the stress, you must anneal the sample at around 800 C for you know, a prolonged period of time, maybe around 30 minutes. To avoid this stress altogether, Iwasaki et al. uses microwave plasma chemical vapor deposition. Now the time scale is much longer, but you don't have to deal with the stresses and the annealing optimization. Another fabrication method put forward by uh, Pavlinov is high pressure, high temperature um, transformation of graphene into diamond. Now, the conditions require a rather large pressure of six to seven gigapascals and rather high temperatures and create grain sizes that are on the order of uh, micrometers and thus we get micro diamonds. Whereas, Akimov uses similar methods but replaces graphene with naphthalene powder, which is C10H8, 
and uh, has control over the size with pressure modulation. From seven to eight gigapascals, you get micro diamonds, and from nine to eight gigapascals, you get nano diamonds. We also have a change in the time scale required. This method is on the order of about 10 seconds, whereas the other takes hours. As we move into the bulk of the research, it's important to understand what a zero phonon line is, as well as a phonon sideband. The zero phonon line, seen here as the narrow peak on the left, simply put, is the wavelength at which the excitation and relaxation are not phonon assisted. It is the intrinsic difference between the ground and excited energy states. The phonon sideband is a broader feature, which is due to the phonon assisted transitions. Now the ZPL of the GEV center, which was quoted earlier about 6 or 10 nanometers, is confirmed in the Iwasaki paper, where we see here that the MPCBD has about 602 nanometer peak, whereas the ion implementation is about 602.5 as well as a bit broader. This is due to the stress in the lattice that causes broadening. Over here, we see a heat map of the photon count of ion implantations where they have selected a single emitter. Down here, we see the single emitter ZPL and two other peaks. This is the Raman peak somewhere in the 500s. And in order to isolate the ZPL uh, during experimentation, they required the use of a bandpass filter at about 600. Now, the other two methods, which are high, temp high pressure, high temperature, you know, conversions of graphite and naphthalene into diamond, have thermal broadening in both uh, pictures. And finally, we get a confirmation of the fact that it is indeed germanium that is the active uh, atom or impurity in this site. Experimentally, this was done by Ikamov, who used germanium isotopes to get shifts in the peak, which means that it was indeed germanium, which uh, the peak is attributed to. Also, Iwasaki uses DFT and first principle calculations to find both the structure, the split vacancy over here, as well as the band gap of the vacancy. Now we can see here that the neutral GE as well as the uh, negative GEV have similar band gap energies. Now beyond just the ZPL and the split structure of the germanium vacancy center, we are also interested in its other uh, optical properties, such as single emission. This is usually characterized by the second order autocorrelation function g squared of tau, which is found in almost all these papers. It's usually seen as a graph here with a dip at zero time delay. Now in context of photons, there are two major cases we are interested in anti-bunching and bunching. Anti-bunching has g squared at 0 less than 1, and bunching has g squared at 0 greater than 1. To break this down a bit more, anti-bunching is the case where in an infinitesimal time delay after a single photon is counted, a second photon is not seen. This implies that there is single emission. Basically, there is a gap between the counting of photons. Whereas, in bunching, um, we have the case where at an infinitesimal time delay after a single photon is counted, other photons are also counted. This is usually associated with a thermal excitation or laser emissions. Basically, in the spatial and temporal domain, there are photons right next to other photons, and so they can be counted at almost a zero time difference. This over here indicates an anti-bunching behavior because we see it is less than one at zero. Now the excitation lifetimes can be calculated multiple ways. It's done empirically by Iwasaki, who uses this formula over here, and finds that T1 of a germanium vacancy center is about 1.4 to 5.4 nanoseconds. This is comparable to the silicon vacancy centers and is much less than the NV vacancy centers, which are around uh, 10 to 12 nanoseconds. According to data collected by Basker at Harvard, excitation lifetimes seem to be temperature independent. And we also see that lifetimes overall are a bit greater, which is most likely due to the preparation of the germanium single emitter within these samples.
Finally, we have the challenges moving forward for GEV centers. Now there's challenges for the fabrication in ion implantation where we need to improve optimization times for annealing. We need to uh, improve control over dosage so that we can get these predetermined arrangements as we've seen in silicon vacancies. Spin coherence times overall need to be increased, which can immediately be done by lowering temperatures, but you know, if there's another option, that would be better. And there's also a, a lack of device design compared to SIV centers and MV centers. This is most likely attributable to its recent emergence. This field, once again, is only about a year and a half old, but hopefully device design, or at least theoretical device design, will come about. Finally, we need demonstrations of the transferability of advanced spin techniques such as advanced ESR and QND operations um, from NV centers into GEV centers. Now the advantages over silicon vacancies are, as Basker puts it, a significantly higher quantum of efficiency than silicon vacancies due to its lack of temperature dependence. There is also an increase in fabrication control due to the reduced incorporation efficiency, which Iwasaki credits to the larger atomic radius of germanium compared to silicon. So here we are, future outlook. What is left for this field? So right now, the state of the art is nonlinear optics. Basker et al. at Harvard is demonstrating single emitter uh, GEV centers in a tapered waveguide with Bragg mirrors. They do photonic coupling and they also do um, this nonlinear optics and uh, photon extinction. Now due to its exceptional high quantum efficiency, it could also lead to the realization of optical nodes with strong atom-like coupling. GEV centers have been shown to have stronger coupling than any other quantum system yet tested. This could lead to the integrated quantum information networks. And finally, we have the potential for quantum memory units if the spin coherence can be improved, you know, of a couple orders of magnitude to where, you know, NV centers and superconducting qubits are currently. Here are my sources for this paper. As you can see, there's a very limited amount of sources up here that actually have to do with straight research and the others have to do with images. I hope you enjoyed my description of this new archetypal system for Cronin Research and have a good day. Thank you.